This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. You know, it's amazing when you have a visiting prophet, he gives a prophetic word and prepares the way for the sermon. Today for Shavuot, the name of the servant today is Shavuot, the God who speaks. And I think I have handled all the different truths of Shavuot over the years, every which way possible. We dealt with that the first Pentecost to the first Shavuot. God gave the law. He wrote it on stone. On the first Shavuot, after Jesus raised from the dead, He gave the power to live the law by writing it on our hearts. We also see a contrasting in the word that in the garden they accepted the fire of the nechesh of the serpent into the minds of men. In fact, the Illuminati still brag about it. They call it fire in the minds of men. In Greek philosophy and, and theology, it's called the Promethean fire. Yet on the day of Pentecost, after Jesus rose from the dead, there were tongues of fire that set on their head to displace the knowledge of good and evil with the knowledge of the kingdom. I don't know about you, but I just love the way God works. We've dealt with the fact everybody gets caught up in speaking in tongues, and they forget that there were tongues of fire, so there were multiple types of fire within that that laid on them, and each one has its unique characteristic in the temple of God because we are the temple and we are the priesthood. Under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit would come temporarily. He would rest upon the prophet, priest, and king. But how many know that that was just for a moment? Man, after Jesus rose from the dead, he breathed on him, said, Receive you the Holy Ghost. At that moment, they were saved. The Holy Spirit moved in. What we see on the day of Pentecost is the Holy Spirit coming upon the mantle of Jesus for ministry. It's interesting, after the first Pentecost, when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments, the Bible said that they were, Israel was up playing. They were basically having an orgy around the golden calf. 3,000 died that day. But yet on the day of Pentecost after, after Peter preached, is it any wonder that there were 3,000 saved? There's perfect symmetry to the Word of God. The Holy Spirit also, when the Holy Spirit leads the believer, we can also overcome the Tower of Babel judgment by living and moving in the Spirit. Guys, I've been all over the world when I was in the military. I've sat there in, 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 in times of ministry that I'm preaching and you had to have a guy interpret in, 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 in Italian, one interpreted in German, and we're fellowshipping with one another, and nobody spoke the language, but there was something that transcended language. You could feel kindred spirits. There was a, there was a fellowship there that went beyond language because it was of the Spirit. We need to be more sensitive to that today. We seem to be too carnal. You know, the, if the guy dresses right and, or does this right and does that right or promises you, it's almost, it's almost like a Ronco channel, you know, that we're, we're flipping through the shopping network. If you give here, I'll give, God will give you ten angels. Oh, yeah, well, God will give you not only ten angels, but I'll send you a fleece. And I'll do this and I'll do that. We have magic bread. You put it on top of your wallet. That wallet will get full of money. 
<sighs> Guys, when Jesus comes back, one of the anointings of Messiah, according to Isaiah chapter 11, he won't judge by what he hears. He won't judge by what he sees. He judges by the Spirit. For us to not get taken in the last days, we better learn how to hear the Holy Ghost, and we better learn how to move in the Spirit of God and be sensitive to what God's doing. That's not even my notes. That's just extra. When Peter declared the very first sermon, Mr. Scared, it's amazing what happens when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you know what I mean? Mr. Scared denied Christ three times. He had, he had hoof and mouth disease. Most of the time, Peter walked with both feet in his mouth, and so it was a miracle that he could even walk. But yet, on the day of Pentecost, he comes out. And sometimes we miss what he says in Acts 2.38. When he says, be baptized in the name of Jesus, he was not correcting Messiah when Messiah said to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see, there was a promise of Moses that there was one going to come just like Moses. Moses is the, is the prototype in the Old Testament to help us recognize who Jesus is. And he says, when he comes, he will only say that which the Father gives him to say. And when he speaks, you had better hear him. And if you don't, the Almighty will hold you accountable. And so Peter gets in this sermon and he gets to the punchline and he said, this same Jesus who you crucified has rose from the dead. And so by declaring that we baptize in his name, he was declaring before all of Israel, we have heard the one who Moses promised about that would only speak the things of God. He would not add to it. He would not take away from it. And his word is pure. And we are declaring because within that culture, there were many baptisms. When the apostle Paul enrolled into the school of Hillel, and, and it depends on which commentary you read. Either he was baptized in the name of Hillel, who founded the school, or he was baptized under the name of Gamaliel, the one who was a descendant of Hillel that was his mentor, saying, I'm going to follow your teachings from here on out. So when we're baptized in the name of Jesus, it is not a secret formula to be saved. It is announced to the world that we have heard the one that Moses promised, and we are going to follow him the rest of our lives. How I many know there is no secret sauce except trusting in the completed work of Jesus? But one of the things that he emphasizes, we have heard the one who speaks. Part of Pentecost is realizing God still speaks today. And, if there, and we, we need to understand that we are living in the most prophetic time in the history of the planet. Even more so, dare I say, than when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee, fulfilling prophecy one step at a time. We're, more, we're in a more prophetic time today, and 95% of the church is clueless to what's going on because we have forgot to listen. So I'm going to preach Pentecost out of the book of Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, starting with 18, because this is essential. You know, we have been, we have been begging for God to, to release an anointing for healing, for revealing of evil, and all these things. Did you know, before he can truly do that, he's got to correct the church. Judgment must first start in the house of God. And for a lot of the house of God, it needs to be slapped upside the head so it can wake up. And get out of this techno sorcery slumber of Babylon that they have placed on us. That we are on cruise control and we've been listening to the wrong radio station that plays worldly lullabies that puts us to sleep. So we're going to deal here starting in verse 18 with the God who speaks. And he's reminding us what we have come to contrasted to when Israel came out of the wilderness or came into the wilderness, went up to Mount Sinai out of Egypt. And how many know that God put on a show for them at Mount Sinai? Okay, now he had already judged all the gods of Egypt. And in those nine plagues, he stripped Egypt of the wealth that it had gained by what Joseph did when they first went down there. 
Let me tell you something. God can keep a tally and he knows how to settle the balance, doesn't he? They get up there and I, I, can see, I can see Moses the whole time saying, I can't wait for you to see the burning bush. I, this burning bush is awesome. It'll burn and it'll burn and it'll burn, but it don't burn, you know. And he gets up there and God sets the mountain on fire. And when you read it in Hebrew, as God is speaking, the God himself, the angels are blowing shofars. It wasn't, it wasn't the guys down there with their little horns. And it kept getting louder and louder. And it got so loud that it began to shake the mountain and the ground that they were on. The book of Hebrews reveals to us that Moses was kind of getting freaked out. <laughs> okay, let's read this. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, that burned with fire into blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot through with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembled. I can see him saying, dude, I just came to show you a bush. But God was wanting to sear in their minds, if you will, his majesty, his awesome power, because he was getting ready to take them in a land that they were going to have to fight giants. They didn't have to lift a finger to get out of Egypt. All they had to do was believe. But once you cross the Jordan, you better learn how to use a sword. You better learn how to use a spear. You better know how to use that shield. Especially when you only come up to the knees of the guys that you got to fight. But let me tell you something. A shorties with the power of God is more than enough to take down a giant. I love Caleb. He had to wander an extra 40 years, so now he's 80-something. When he finally gets to cross the Jordan and take all these young whippersnappers over the Jordan, and he said, y'all youngins, you just step back. You just give me the mountain. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm approaching 59. I'm thinking, boy, there had to be the power of God or you wouldn't get a molehill taken. You know what I mean. But he, God restored, and, he, and that, that power of God that he saw on that mountain so changed him that when he went over with Joshua and saw the, the giants and they brought back one bunch of grapes they had to put on a pole. I mean, you know, my grandkids love grapes. How would you like to have one about this big, just one grape? You squeeze it and you go ahead and fill up a quart jar, you know what I mean? And those two guys looked at those giants and said, we got this. Because when you look at what they were talking about, Goliath would have been a midget. They were as tall as cedar trees. They were about 48 feet tall. That's a whole lot bigger than a nine-footer. And Caleb looked at them and said, man, we got this. God will open up a can of whoop giant on them, and they won't see what's coming. But he said, now Listen. Verse 12, but verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the, the holy Jerusalem, or the heavenly Jerusalem, to, the, to an innumerable company of angels, to the, the great assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. Raise your hand, say, I'm registered in heaven. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Devil weeps, I rejoice. My name's there, and it ain't getting blotted out, because I choose to be faithful. And to the spirits of just men made perfect or mature. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And to the blood, the sprinkling of blood, which speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. And that is the word for the moment. See that you do not refuse to hear him who speaks. Because some of the stuff that God is going to say might be a little scary. Like get up off your blessed assurance and start moving in the kingdom and throw away your Willy Wonka golden ticket that has put you to sleep. Thinking you said a 30-second prayer and that's going to get you into eternity. When all the Word of God says, it's, if that's truly life-changing, it's how you live your life after you said that 30-second prayer. Okay? 
We need to understand that the moment that we got saved, the moment that we made Jesus Christ Lord Savior of our life, your spirit men came back alive, and you're connected to the New Jerusalem. You got a hotline to the third heaven. The moment that you say Jesus, you're there. The Bible even says that the hope that is within us goes beyond the veil. That that moment that we pray, God can actually see what's going on in your heart while you pray. And we're to function, the Apostle Paul dealing in Ephesians, we were, fun, we were supposed to function from the reality of being connected to Him in Christ. Therefore, I am seated with Him because I am one with Him. But it's not a Greco-Roman mindset of lording it over stuff. It is living by His commands because He commands, I do. And so if I go to a mountain and I look up and he says, that mountain ought not be there, then I can say, be thou removed and cast into the sea. And that mountain is moving. It will grow legs and it'll go. But if he says, climb the mountain, and you say, mountain be moved, how many know is this going to sit there and stare you in the face because you better hear him who speaks? We got to go beyond our sound bites. Christi modern Christianity loves sound bites. Heaven is not impressed with them, neither is the devil. Over the years, I've challenged people when they try to give me a sound bite to answer the question that I gave them. And I, and, and instead of asking, and I ask them another question. Okay, now define what you just said. Uh, 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 give me the word about what you just said. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh. How many know, oh, 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 is not an answer. Because sound bites give the illusion that we're deep and that we know the mysteries of God when all it does is actually reveal how little we know because we have not heard him who speaks. We're connected to the new Jerusalem. We're connected to the faithful angels of God, the immortals that refuse to fall. I like them boys. The Bible even talks about how they were confirmed in their holiness because they wouldn't fall with Lucifer and they wouldn't yield to the temptation of Genesis 6 or Genesis 11. They wouldn't yield to it and it confirmed their holiness. I like them boys. And I have determined in my life I want to live in such a way to make their life easy. My job is not to see how, make, how hard I can make it on my angel, okay? There have been times in my life I've apologized to my guardian angel saying, sorry I was so stuck on stupid for so long. And I made it hard on you and most of the time you were running trying to catch up with me. Saying the whole time, don't. <laughs> kind of like running after a toddler that's just gotten mobile and you haven't child proof your house yet. Do you know what I mean? Okay. We're connected to the creator, the judge of all. Man. I like having a personal relationship to the judge. Jesus, who is the mediator. We don't under, understand what that means. Not only is he praying for us, he's in the position to make sure that the Holy Spirit's working in our lives so that we can get the full benefit of what he did at the cross. You see, it's not that, that we just want the, the lamb to receive the full, the full blessing of his suffering. It's not just every soul saved, but it's every soul transformed, living for God and fulfilling their destiny. That is the reward of the Lamb who was slain. And He's mediating that for us. He's trying to position us to where we can hear God, that we can know what to do, especially in the days ahead. And then we're admonished to make sure that we hear God. Not what the flesh wants to hear. I have found in my own life very, 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 very seldom does God ever speak something my flesh likes. On the rare occasion that I've been involved in ministry or something all day long, and my blood sugar has dropped, and the Holy Spirit says you need to get something to eat, that's probably about the only time that I have ever heard Him say anything that my spirit says, yeah, I'm all into, or my, my flesh says, I'm all into that because I'm about ready to tank. Most of the time, anytime He speaks, it requires a hammer and a nail to take a big chunk of flesh and to nail it to the cross. Now let's jump up to verse 7. 
Oh, we're going to speak about chastisement. Oh, isn't that fun? Yeah, it is. If you know what's good for you. Verse 7, Hebrews chapter 12. If we endure the chastising, God deals with us as sons. Now, you need to underline that in your Bible in Hebrews because people that worry about, am I, am I really born again? Am I really saved? Does God correct you? If the Holy Ghost gets on your case when you get out of line, that is a sign that you're saved. The guy who says, the Holy Spirit lets me get away with anything, you ain't his. You're listening to another spirit. And the more you grow in God, the tighter the rain gets. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastising, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastise us as seems best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Underline that in your Bible. That holiness is something that the church has lost. Church culture does not replace personal holiness. Because in church culture, as long as you cut your hair a certain way, dress a certain way, and memorize a few, a few phrases like, thank you, Jesus, whatever the Lord wants, you get the Christian ease down, you can fit into that culture. But do not equate that with holiness. In fact, when you get somebody in the midst of that that walks in holiness, it makes all these sound biters very nervous. I remember years ago that uh, we were having Wednesday night this men's fellowship and Micah brought in some guys from work and we were in depth studying of the Bible. And this guy, the more that we talked, the more nervous he got. And I mean, he was like a cat on a hot tin roof. And, and there was a pause. He looked up and said, man, this is something I have not felt in years. And I said, what? Conviction! And we asked, how did he like it? He never came back. <laughs> because in the feel-good church, conviction is not welcomed. But it's the chief ministry of the Holy Spirit. The feel-good church will pat you on the head and give you a warm fuzzy right as you go off a cliff. And as you're falling, they'll say, it'll get better when it stops. And the whole time the Holy Spirit was trying to correct you so that you wouldn't go off a cliff. But that doesn't work in the feel-good church of today. I remember there were a couple times in my life that I was about to get in real trouble and, and somebody grabbed my ear and dragged me the other way. How many know that hurt? Or you get the application of the Board of Correction to the seat of learning? And you're howling with the dogs out in the backyard? It didn't feel good at the moment. But I wonder how many kids almost got their arm pulled out of socket because their mom or dad grabbed them trying to keep them from running out in front of a speeding car. And how many times we need to understand God corrects us because he loves us, because he wants his holiness to show through us, because it's going to take the holiness of God. There, there are two resonances in the earth, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the wicked one. I know we've dealt with this before. I've even, I even think it even comes with the residents of the earth, which is 7.83, even the earth itself, and all those are biblical numbers, are, are, is wired to hear the voice of God. Your DNA has a, basically an antenna array built on the outside of it. And scientists are trying to figure out what kind of cosmic vibrations where it was your DNA meant to pick up. I know who exactly was the voice of God. And 7.83 will actually resonate through your body. Hertz will resonate through your body and you'll hear it in your head. That's one of the reasons why there are NATO regulations forbidding that type of psychological warfare. But 6.66 Hertz will do the same thing. I wonder if the devil just can't quite match the voice of God and his resonance is 6.66 Hertz, which will still travel up through the body 
and it will appear in the mind just like if it was the voice of God. And if I'm so tuned in to 6.66 and not enough tuned into 7.83, you're not going to survive what's coming on the earth. That's why the correction is necessary. The more holiness that I'm walking in because I'm living according to this book, empowered by the Holy Spirit walking in the commandments of God, the more that I do that, the more I'm tuned into His frequency, and I do not want to have to have God yell. I want to be able to hear Him whisper, and I can hear His voice over the din of the earth. Because you could be traveling down the road at 70 miles an hour, and the Holy Spirit says you better pull over. And how many, if you don't, you may come around a corner and meet something you don't want to meet. That has happened to a many of a man of God that have testimony. John Alexander Dowie actually uh, shares about how God told him to pull over on the, on the curb on the other side of the road. And so he did. It was right before a big curve. And when he came around, within seconds, a semi was over both lanes, and he would have had nowhere to go if he had not done that at that moment. In the ancient plains of Shinar, an evil was born. The first world king, the prototype transhuman, the ultimate despot, Nimrod. In Babylon, the son of perdition devised the Shinar Directive, a plan to enslave humanity and make war against the God of Heaven. God's intervention at the Tower of Babel only delayed Nimrod's hellish plans as the powers of Mystery Babylon gather to create the new Tower of Babel and to prepare for the Son of Perdition's return, Heaven is issuing a clarion call to the remnant. The Shinar Directive will reveal the strategies of the enemy that will help you untangle yourself from them and become the victorious church. It is time for the remnant to wake up, discern the times, and be infused with Heaven's power to withstand the Shinar Directive by Dr. Michael Lake. Get your copy today at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.